know a lot of people ask me like how I went viral mm. like 10 times in yeah. a row and they think there's some sort of secret. There really is no secret. It's being consistent. It's having a strategy. It's showing up even when you don't want to. It's being real, like letting people know you're there, like responding to them, being kind, even when people aren't being kind right. to you. Don't take the bait, right? Yeah. Use it as, you know, a platform to, to grow your own brand mm -hmm. and solidify your credibility and just like listen and have fun and, and engage with people. Welcome to Profit Let's Season 2, Our Journey to a Million. We are on Episode 20. Ooh, that's a round number. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm Melissa Kwan, co-founder and CEO of eWebinar. I'm here with my co-host, eWebinar COO, Todd Parmley. How's it going? Good. We're still in New York. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I like this. Yeah. I live here. <laughs> that's so, true. Yeah. I wish I lived here, but it's too expensive. Yeah, I can vouch for that. Yeah, we're, uh, we're subletting this, um, like, amazing loft right now. Right. Um, like I belong to this nomad community and people try to sublet their space in New York because it's so expensive. Uh, when I lived here, I also did that. And it's just like friends of friends kind of thing. And we're just covering their rent. It's like a $10,000 a month loft. Yeah. But it's like, and you would imagine it's like top notch, but it's not really like, it's just a big space. The location. Well, yeah. location I mean, is insane. Location and size. Yeah. Those are actually the measures of the price of an apartment in New York. Yeah. You could Not the luxury level. No. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that's another world, right? Yeah, but yeah. like, but like you could have the crappiest kitchen. Yeah. The toilet is yeah. in the kitchen. I'm not kidding. I mean, yeah. one of the first apartments I saw was in the yeah. heart of Soho when I moved here. The shower was in the kitchen. Yeah. The toilet was in a room that was so small you had to put your knees on the wall in order to sit down. <laughs> I remember when I lived here, and I lived in like a co-living house, like a four-bedroom yeah, right. house in, in Gramercy. And one of my roommates were moving out. Like we were just a halfway house for people moving to New York. Yeah. And she was looking on Craigslist, and she showed me a listing of someone who was renting out half her bed because she works in the restaurant industry, and she oh, wasn't going to be home at God. night. So she wow. was hoping to find someone who has an opposite schedule. Oh my God, that's next For level. like 600 bucks a month or something. That is next level. Like, it's crazy. It's bonkers. Um, but yeah, so this space is like, for people that know New York, it's on Elizabeth and Houston. Not Houston, even though it's spelled Houston. Yeah, right. It's Houston. Right. It's, how, it's like, Don't how do you know you're mistake. from New York? Yeah, yeah, right. When you come here. Like, well, the first time I came to New York, I was talking to the cab driver. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Houston Street. They're like, what? what? What street? Yeah. And I'm like, I later on learned that it was Houston. But I'm like, come on. Like, you know it's Houston. <laughs> like, it's yeah, a but, very New York moment. Yeah, but he's going to take yeah. the opportunity to humiliate yeah. you a little bit. Right? Exactly. Because I was a tourist. <laughs> and um, just to be also, this, where you're staying is where the Bowery was. Like, this was like... The one of the yeah. worst neighborhoods in New York. Yeah, there are no worse neighborhoods anymore. There aren't. Yeah. No, there really isn't. But I think like ten thousand a month, any other place, right? maybe that's not like too. Tokyo or whatever. Yeah, like right. that's like super luxury, multiple bedrooms, like high end appliances, yeah. everything. Maybe a here, staff. <laughs> here you're just getting a big box in a good area, and yeah. we will pay for it. <laughs> but it's such a treat to like be able to stay there for like. Like three weeks, yeah, right, and like, and just to be, and not to commit to that. Like, I would never be able to pay that. No, and I'm not even like including what I don't know what the maintenance or yeah, right. internet or gas, whatever right, costs. Right. But like, this is a building where you still have to put a key into the elevator. <laughs> I'd never seen one of these where you like every floor has like a key, yeah, and not like a fob. Like you literally put your key in and you turn and then you can press the button. <laughs> Um, but anyways, very, very, very grateful to be there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in the last episode, we talked about our 12 $0 marketing strategies, mm -hmm. um, but also some of the some of the painful mistakes that we made yes. spending um, yes. on non-$0 mar marketing <laughs> strategies <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, before we arrived to that. Um, yeah. And so to, today we're going to go deeper into one of those strategies, which is, you know, social selling. Yeah. So if you are on LinkedIn, if you're following me on LinkedIn, you already know that I'm a frequent contributor of that pl platform. Uh, but you might not know the backstory yeah. of why I started there. I touched on that in the previous episode. Um, but I thought I wanted to like dig deeper into it just because it was such a big part. Well, the, ob us the obvious question is, why did you do it? Why did you start doing it? Yeah, I mean, I, I 
completely ran out of leads. Um, as we talked <laughs> about, reason, yeah, yeah, I completely right. ran out of leads. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know anything about marketing. Mm. Uh, my friend Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Lobo, also right. a startup guy, uh, told me to look at you know LinkedIn, specifically Justin Welsh. Um, I had to unfollow him recently because like the content was pretty repetitive. <laughs> Um, and I think his content is really aimed for like people coming out of the workforce hmm. and like coming into LinkedIn. Hmm. So at some point, I think I just um, outgrew yeah, his content, content, which is yeah, sure. which is fine. Yeah, it happens. Um, but I was I was just fascinated by how big of an audience hmm. he was able to be. I think it was like three, four hundred thousand followers at the time, wow. just on that one channel. That's huge for LinkedIn, Huge. I mean, especially. I may never get there. Yeah. Uh, a What's lot of your, people don't. Do you know what your audience is now? I think it's like 40K or something. That's very but respectable. I'm, but I'm growing very slowly now that. Right. Um, I mean, the platform's changed. Yeah. I mean, it, it used to be a lot easier, hmm. um, but I've also kind of toned down my like my my own time. Yeah. The sure. ROI has to be worth it. Right. Um, but I still think it's it's in it's an important channel. Mm -hmm. um, and even if LinkedIn is not your channel, maybe Instagram's your channel, I think being on some channel is still important. Um, so I basically took, um, from there I took Justin's course yeah. on how to build an audience specifically on LinkedIn. And I still recommend that course because it's a foundational course on the knowledge of mm -hmm. like why this is important, how people engage with it, how you can how you can come up with content based on your expertise yeah, and what people's mindset is mm. when they follow you. Mm. So how you can write content to be more compelling mm. to that audience and also how you can write your profile such that when someone is interested in your content and they click on your name, how your profile can be written in a way that converts them. Because mm. ultimately that's what you want. If they don't pay you, yeah. you're just spending time writing content. Right. Right. So um, that was kind of my journey. So I committed to writing every single day or not. I didn't write every single day. I committed to pushing out a piece of content every single day for 90 days. Hmm. So I had a process on on how I was doing that. Hmm. Um, but I think a lot of people, when they think about like why, like they ask me why social matters. Hmm. Right. Because I can't really attribute like money to it. Um, but I think like only in the last couple of years have I seen people care about the people behind the product in software. Yes, right. In like they always did yeah. in consumer products, even like going right. to a restaurant. Right. Or you go to a farm to table restaurant, that's the whole idea. Right? right. You go to a sweetery and that's the whole idea. Like you know exactly where this meat's coming from, where right. this farm is coming from, or where this, these vegetables are coming from, yeah. which farm. And some some of these menus have it written. Yeah. Right. And th I think there was a time when we would just go buy a brand name, right? right? Like the latest Louis Vuitton or whatever. And I feel like nowadays people kind of shy away from that, right? Yeah, it really has shifted. I hadn't really thought about this, but it is so much more now about the people behind the brand, what yeah. motivates them. The story. What, the story of, the, uh, of yeah. how they got to where, why they decided to do yeah. what they're doing. Like all of that would have been like ridiculous yeah. in advertising or marketing, like maybe 10 years ago. Well, I mean, now people care about where the materials are coming from. Yeah, is right. it ethical, yeah, right? right? Like, is it real leather? Is it not, right? right. Like, so everything has a story that yeah. we care so much about. So that, I think, was being transferred into software. Yeah. I would say that a lot of people that write all the time on LinkedIn are not, like, software yeah, founders. Sure. There's a lot of um, consultants, coaches, people mm. from software that are starting their own consulting um, practice. Yep. But there are like a handful of us that, that do that, like just share their learnings, experience, stories, and, and that's what I do. And part of that course tells you to figure out what, what you, what, where you have unique knowledge, right? Mm. Why do people have to follow you? And I think a lot of times we underestimate like what we know yes. because it's, it's common sense. Yeah. Like, why would I write about boot, bootstrapping? Like, I'm not, like, I, I've never built a big company. Right? That's the first thought you doubt yourself, right? But then I realized from writing for 90 days every day is people really connect with that content because what I thought was common sense just by doing it for so many years, it's like brand new information to someone else. I mean, I have a very good friend who is always saying, it's so, that's so obvious. I'm like, <laughs> buddy, like, yeah. it's not. It's obvious to you. Yeah. 
And if you can get that, if you can communicate that, but you have to figure out what that is, I guess. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I realized was people don't want to be sold to. And right. this was one of the reasons why I had to look for other channels. Yeah, it was sure. like they weren't picking up my calls. They weren't responding to emails, text messages. Like I was just trying so many things, right? And people want to discover something on their own. Yeah. So I want them to either look up webinar software, maybe come to our site. Maybe they'll maybe they'll type in eWebinar. Maybe maybe my LinkedIn will come up. I don't know, right? Like I was willing to take that chance, but being active on LinkedIn was part of my brand that I like it was part of the journey, I yeah. guess, that I wanted people to be on as they were discovering like, whether we were the right software for them. It was part of being accessible. And um, and then I realized that I was getting all these like kind of dopamine rushes. <laughs> right? I remember them. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, whoa, people actually care about yeah. like, what I'm saying. Yeah. Right? And I was just you know, I'm very good at like having built three companies now with very little resources. I'm just very good at being scrappy, right? And it's like yeah. things like, how do you hire someone when you have no money, right? Right? Like, what are your favorite questions in an interview? Or like some of the mistakes that I made in giving equity to a dev shop in my last company. Yeah, and I think one of the things that was remarkable as someone standing on the sidelines watching this kind of unfold and <laughs> seeing I wasn't experiencing the dopamine hits, but yeah. I was seeing them <laughs> hit you, yeah, yeah. which was very fun to watch. Um, but the one of the hu biggest pieces of feedback was no one is this honest. No one is this transparent about what they know, about what they've done wrong. I think that kind of authenticity and openness people are hungry for. Yeah, um, they just they just want to know how to. First of all, it, it helps them understand they're not alone, but they want real workable knowledge that they can actually like put into practice maybe from somebody who's done it. Yeah, and I think a lot of times people just want to know, they want to be reassured that they're in the right place. Yeah, right. Because nobody really talks about their failures. I talk a lot about everything, right? Like yeah. some successes, but I've had a lot of failures, yeah. right? And not massive ones, but you know, hiring the wrong person, spending money on the wrong thing. And I talk about all those things, right? Giving yeah. equity away, to someone who, you know, like that, yeah, yeah, to yeah. someone who didn't buy that equity and how that affected my exit. Um, my greatest hustle story of an inviting the Zillow CEO to my house for dinner. With no other guests. <laughs> With no other guests. <laughs> that is another LinkedIn post. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll put that into That's the show legendary. notes as well. <laughs> um, but these are just some of the reasons why I was doing it. And it, it really forced me to get my thoughts into a very concise, right? like in, in a very concise manner, because there are also limited characters that you can put. Right. It's one of those things where like you can't really write a long letter like I wish I could. Yeah. And then it forces you to think about the things that are actually important. Yeah. Like once you start cutting those things out. And it just I think writing like gets your brain in a different state. It definitely does. It definitely does. And it's something that if you do more of it, you get better at it, period. Yeah. Like I don't care if you, maybe you're not the greatest writer. You're never going to be the greatest writer. But if you write regularly with a purpose to your writing, you will get better, period. And especially yeah. if you're getting feedback from people because you start to see, oh, that resonates. And then you start to realize your expertise, right? Something that was just common sense to you is a revelation to others. And that's, yeah. that's you learn that. And then you start to be able to identify other things like that. You know, I've had that own experience in writing content for the web, or for the blog even. And I think the, the cool thing about writing on LinkedIn is you don't have to be a great writer. No. Because it's it's like a longer Twitter yeah, post, right. right? And okay, fine, it's bad, it disappears in a day. Yeah. Or you can delete it if you don't like it, yep. right? And the thing is, the way I write is yeah. I write as if I'm speaking, and I do that a lot anywhere, like everywhere else, but you can't really do that in a blog post. Right? I mean, it's much harder, yeah. but definitely in LinkedIn, I think people want that. They yeah. want you to write how you're speaking to them. Like yeah. if I, if I, if I go on LinkedIn and I see something that's really well crafted, it turns me off. You know, I, I just want, um, you know, I think in any kind of social post environment, people just yeah. want the information in a direct, authentic way. And just being on there so actively, like it, it allowed me to engage with other founders or other yeah. executives that were doing similar things. Yeah. Right. And people are always willing to help. So yeah. they're like, if they see that I'm having a problem or I struggled with a problem, like Either they make a comment or they DM me and say, hey, like, have you thought about this? 
So it allowed me to engage with other people and just get free education. Yeah. Because I'm also then reading other people's posts because now I'm spending time on their responding. So I'm naturally spending time on there. I mean, I think at my peak, I was probably spending a couple hours a when, day on When did there. you see for really first see engagement? Like, when did you know that? I mean, like, I, I know there was like, I mean, I know we don't talk about the hockey stick. It doesn't yeah. exist. But when did you know you really had some true engagement? Yeah, so I think when I started, um, I, I didn't have a huge following. I think when I started, I had like like 2,000 yeah. connections. Yeah. I didn't realize there was a difference between connections and followers because yeah. you can connect, you can follow, but you don't have to connect. But yeah. a connection is, is by nature a follower. Yes. Oh, okay. So you can follow, right. but not connect with people. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Like, um, and so I felt like I got engagement pretty quickly. Hmm. Like I wasn't looking for like hundreds of reactions, right? right. right? Like, like what I was surprised by was people were active on there. So in the beginning, like if I go back to like some of the posts that I've made before, like now I'm probably onto like 400 or, or, or something like that. But in the beginning, um, I get like 10 likes, 20 likes, 30 likes, you know, two or three comments. But I think a lot of people are like discouraged by that. Right. But you can't be discouraged by that because yeah. it grows over time. Right. Like now I'm yeah. just starting to build my audience on like platforms like Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. But like. I had like 20 followers. Yeah. And it's like I mean, stupid. It's, yeah. It's so easy to get <laughs> discouraged when you see these people with hundreds yeah. of thousands of followers. But like it, that building yeah. audience, you really have to think. But those hard. people started somewhere. Yeah, of course. And yeah. I think the toughest thing is like you keep doing it. You don't know if people are seeing it. You don't know if you're providing value. You think you look stupid to someone else because your engagement in theory is really low. But consistency beats motivation hmm. any day, hmm. right? Motivation right. comes and goes. Do You're not going to get inspiration, right? right? Like, and, but that's why taking these courses is important, right? right? Because then you create a system. The structure. Yeah. yeah, there's some structure. You're like, it's best if you have an accountability buddy. Right. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really have one per se, but it was like I very quickly built like a small community of, of people who were also Hmm. putting out LinkedIn content. So we would kind of trade ideas on what hmm. worked, what didn't, you know, things like that. Um, but there were a bunch of, I guess, hacks that I realized um, over time um, that I could talk about, like just yeah, kind of yeah. tips what? and tricks on how I actually did it. So if somebody were starting out and you wanted to help fast track them a little bit with some hacks, um, what would you say? How would you answer that? I mean, I definitely say to start, like, just take the course um, I recommend Justin Walsh's course, but I'm sure there's other courses that are out there. It's, it's only because I, that's the course I took. I don't think it's very expensive. I think it's like a couple hundred bucks or something like that, but it's, it's well worth it. It's going to cut down your time to experiment. Um, like someone else has done it. There is an equation. I don't am, reinvent the wheel. Oh my God. This is one of like m my biggest adult lessons in life was yeah. <laughs> don't figure something out from scratch yeah. when somebody else has done it already. Yeah. Also, um, try a bunch of different content styles, right? Mm. So the course will have multiple different content styles. Yeah. Um, so I forgot what they were. It was like education. It was like opinion piece. Like there were mm. like four major pillars. Yeah. But so many people have already hacked this. Mm. So there are different uh, content mm. styles. Also, the content style dictates how you write the content, how you write the hook, right? The first right. line. How do you get people to to expand on your content so they can read most of it, right? So try different content styles because if you don't, you can't find the one that works for you. Right. So in the end, I found a content style that worked for me that nobody else had. And then ironically, other people started copying mine. Right, but it's never as good, right? It's yeah. It always fails. Like if you try to write in someone else's voice, it's not going to be engaging. Yeah, and... And I got to say, like, every time I try to copy someone else's template, yeah. because you have to, yeah, I sure. get so little engagement because it didn't sound authentic. Yeah. I mean, sure. At the beginning, you're just learning, right? Yeah. But like, until you get a really clear point of view, clear voice, people aren't going to care. I mean, there are certain content styles that will work for people with massive audiences. Hmm. Like, they'll throw a motivational quote. Everybody likes it. Yeah, right. But 
I've actually done the math on this, right? If you have half a million followers and then you see like, oh, there's 2,000 people like, like this, I should try that. But do the math on the percentage. So that engagement is still low. Right. Right. But it size. seems like yeah. a lot because you don't have that following. Right. So when you want to copy someone else's content style to see if it works for you, because it looks like they have a lot of engagement, yeah. you need to look at the percentage. Yeah. And see if it's actually good or not, because I, I yeah. guarantee you a lot of times it's, it's not that great. Um, but once I found the style that worked for me. Yeah. Like there was a time when I hit like, I think, eight or 10 viral posts in a row. Um, yeah. in its heyday, like over a course of like three months or something like that. Yeah. And that really shot up my, my audience, my follower count. I just milked that. You were LinkedIn yeah. famous. I, I focus on what worked. I scaled back on the number of pieces that I was writing because it took a lot of time. Those were longer, more intentional pieces. They were listicles. And I just kept hammering them until, until that ran out. Yeah, right. I mean, that was amazing. I mean, yeah. the, the number of followers that grew. It was it, insane. It was insane. It was like 2,000 to 4,000 followers per post. Per post, right. But don't forget, I was also spending 10 hours on Yes, them. right. So, like, like, how much time had you spent on LinkedIn, period, before you started hitting that? I think it was remember? like a year, more than a year, year and right. a half or something right. like that. So, yeah. Um, and that was like completely accidental. Right. I was like, I think one day I like didn't have enough time and I'm like, oh, I'll just throw everything in a list and like back up each point with like evidence of my experience. Mm. So it was a counterintuitive advice based on my experience. And then it worked so well that other people are starting to copy it. In fact, like there was this guy that like outright just copied. He had he was like a famous like entrepreneur from France. Oh, no. way! <laughs> if I say that, people are going to know who it is. Yeah. OK. But hey, you did it, not me. Yeah, yeah, right. There were like two points that were exactly the same that he didn't even change. I'm like, bro, come on. Right. And these are people that other people follow. It's wild. And I even commented on that. I was like, oh, these read wildly familiar. <laughs> and he like didn't even respond to that. But I'm like, come on. Like, you <laughs> well, can, he's not going to, like, right? Okay, well, you can take inspiration from someone, copy their style, but don't, sure. please don't plagiarize. Especially yeah, yeah. if you're well known, because people are watching you. Yeah. And by the way, that's one of my favorite writing hooks in the business world is contrary opinion. Right. You have a you have a different opinion yeah. uh, than most because of your experience that you can yeah. back up with evidence. That's always yeah. a winner. Yeah. Um, but also, I think it worked. This strategy worked really well for me because I had a system and I was really, really consistent with it. Right. So um, I couldn't write every day, even though I had a piece of content almost daily. So when I was writing those like listicles, counterintuitive advice, I think I would spend like maybe like a couple hours writing it out. Yeah. Another few hours editing it down. Yeah. And then I would pass it to you for that one final right. like edit. Which sometimes was getting it to fit in this yeah. amount of space you had. I use every character. Right. No, I yeah. know. I and know. then I would use emojis to like spruce it up a bit. <laughs> I still do. So I'm like, I'm squeezing every single character in. Yeah. No, I um, but my system was like, I wrote on Mondays. Hmm. I still do that. Like, I don't write as much just on LinkedIn anymore because I'm on multiple different platforms, yeah. including my own newsletter. But Monday, all I do is write. I didn't know that. Yeah. And like writing is a hard thing, right? It's not like, well, these two hours, I'll write and then I'll get back to it tomorrow. Like, it's, it's just like a thing. Like, your mind has to flow. That's the other big lesson. That's actually outside of, well, that's probably the biggest lesson that I learned about writing. You need concentrated, uninterrupted time. Yeah. I don't care who you are. Yeah. And I also had, um, I still, I still maintain this, of course. Like I have, it's not a social calendar, but it's just a massive Google sheet. Yeah. Of all of my posts, when, which day it went out, the URL to it after I post it. And then it's like I had an intern fill in like the number of impressions, reactions, all that. So I could sort it. Yeah. Because um, in the end, I repurposed some of that content. Right. And then on one of those tabs, I had all my ideas logged. Like things that I didn't um, that I never actually expanded on. And there was a time when I was spending so much time on it. My mind was always on it that like I could be at a restaurant waiting in line and like jotting down <laughs> ideas because <laughs> yeah. they just they just came. Right? right. So on Monday, I would go down this list and be like, OK, what do I feel like writing about? Hmm. Um, and I haven't looked at that in, in a long time because I have scaled back, not just like I've scaled back on the number of pieces I write, mm. but scaled up on how much time like I spend on each okay. piece. 
Um, and then I also, the, the URL of that post is important because I sometimes use that to comment on someone else's post to get further engagement. Mm. Right. So I'm just like, all, why am I doing all this? Just to get eyeballs on my profile. Yeah. Because my profile leads to e-webinar. Right. And then some other stuff. Right. Yeah. And my profile builds credibility. Yep. So if somebody asks a question like, oh, I have a question about uh, hiring. Right. Yeah. Then I will go to the relevant post from like last year even. I just yeah. searched a Google Sheet and I'll be like, oh, by the way, I wrote about this here. And then that gets a few more. Mm. So I like kind of like revive that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think the most important thing is I write on Mondays even when I don't feel like it. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a system of like structured when you do things, but also like you have a system for logging things. You're yeah. like it, you just you have to create a repeatable yeah process and then like what's you said, too easy just, to not do it. Yeah. Then you just have to do it no yeah. matter what. Yeah. And I always wrote from my heart. Yeah. Even though I had a list of ideas, yeah. like it just has to speak to me. And like, I'm, I'm of course thinking about a lot of things all the time, but when an idea comes to me, I just write it and I could be on a plane and I could just get out my notes app and I'll just write stuff. Yeah. I find that that's like, and then I write it as if I'm talking to the other person. Right. Uh, but it's, it's just never forced. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I definitely like I think I want to emphasize on like how important it is to take your time with it um, because people know like they know if it's like a genuinely like like a piece that you, you spent time you, on. Right. And, and that you actually care about. Right. So that yeah. like whatever that. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's part of the superpower you have with your writing is um, speaking directly from your own experience from your heart, because. I mean, again, that's one of the main things that people resonated with and don't expect. Yeah. They don't expect it. It's so unexpected. And so it really stands out. And one of the ways to get way more engagement is like in the first hour or two yeah. when it goes out. Yeah. Um, I used to use Buffer to like push out my posts, mm. but now I push them out manually, manually. because I also want to like tag myself in it. Yeah. So it, when you use another software to push things out, like you can't tag someone mm. right so i tag myself at the end i have a call to action and i tag myself because then it's easier to click that yeah, and then right. go to my profile that's a trick mm. that i learned um but i reply to everybody like every single comment like um would either get a reaction or a response so people know i'm there um and then because when someone looks at a post and it has a hundred comments right it looks like a highly engaged post but those hundred comments include my responses. Yeah, right. So if I have fifty comments, I actually have, like, I it actually appears like I have a hundred comments. Yeah, and it's an invitation to engage because you yeah. know you're going to get a response. Yeah, absolutely, and also I reply to every DM so people know I'm there. Sometimes it takes me a while because I forget about them and they get pushed down, yeah. but I always do that, and I also engage with other people's content at the same time while I'm on there. Yeah, sure. But I never engage for the eyeballs because I know like all these courses teach you like, oh, oh, you should comment on, you know, 20 different posts that have big audiences every day. It is so hard to find really thoughtful content that you want to write something about. And, um, and so what you end up getting is people making yeah. comments that are just like clearly there yeah, yeah. only to get. Yeah, and it just sounds like AI. Yeah, right? and you're just like, give me a break. Yeah, so I engage with other creators meaningfully. Right. And, you know, and, and I don't like I don't just like say, oh, Jason Lemkin has something. I'm just going to go, oh, great post, Jason. Right. Like just, just just it also looks bad. Right. So and I also find that when when I post a meaningful comment on someone else, uh, on someone else's post, then someone else from that, from those comments, engage with my like with my question or my comment. Then it becomes like another thing. Right, because also if you're engaging in a meaningful way, then they, you're a peer in a way of that person yeah. that they're already following, so they're going to yeah. look at you, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean the the one thing that I think, I think is uniquely me. Yeah. Is, I'm just myself. Like, yeah. I'm super opinionated. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and I always stand up for what I believe in. Yeah. Like, I openly disagree with people if, like, if they write a comment um, or on another post even yeah. that I just don't agree with. Yeah. So I know a lot of people, like, want to diffuse 
Right. Especially like in social media, because everything like that kind of lives forever and people are kind of mean. So like I do delete and block people who are like there to get me. Yes. And how do I know that? Because not only is it like a gnarly comment. Right. But I go to their profile and they have like 10 connections. Right. So then I feel like, well, you're just out there to like be a hater. Right. And I just don't need to. I just don't need to deal with that. Yeah, and di disrespectfully, or no, I'm sorry, respectfully disagreeing with someone is different than being a troll. Yeah, I remember there was this one post that I wrote. I'd never gotten so much hate before. Which one was it? It was, um, it was something about firing fast. Yes. And That's people were, they were so outraged. Like, they were so mad. Yeah. And then I had to write a follow-up post yeah. on fire, how firing fast didn't mean firing people like in the middle of their job. Right. And without right. cause or without giving them a chance to do their best. Or... Yeah, it was, but it was crazy. But I was like, okay, well I have a chance to either remove the post yeah. or I could show people who I am. Yeah. And I chose the latter. And there were people that were like, wow, like you're really patient with this. <laughs> like I would, and, and actually like a lot of those people were developers. Right. Like there was just there was rage in there yeah, that right. was not related to me. Yeah, had nothing to do had with nothing to do. And and I agreed that there are big corporations that just suck. That don't see like that see people as just a number. Yeah. But as a startup, that wasn't true. And I wanted that I wanted to leverage that as an opportunity to tell people, hey, like this is not how startups treat their people. Like we have yeah. ten people. No, you can't. <laughs> like we can't treat them like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of people ask me like how I went viral mm. like 10 times in a yeah. row and they think there's some sort of secret. Like there really is no secret. Everything I just listed is a secret. It's being consistent. It's having a strategy, right? It's showing up even when you don't want to. It's being real, letting people you're like, letting people know you're there, like responding to them, being kind, even when you're not you know, people aren't being kind right. to you. Don't take the bait, right? Yeah, don't they, don't don't take the bait. Use it as you know a platform to to grow your own brand mm -hmm. and solidify your credibility, and just like listen and have fun and and engage with people. Like, and if like even if you don't have like ten viral posts in a row, which is like super rare, um, you might hit a good one once in yeah. a while. Um, but you know, keep. Just, just keep writing. And also, like, there is no way that you can write for virality. Like, if there were, yeah. people would just do it. Yeah. Right? right? And, like, I remember, like, Jake, our, our, um, our marketer, he actually sent me something a few days ago. And he was like, oh, um, if you want these people to review our software, um, this is what they charge. Yeah. And I looked at one of the packages. And it was, like, $3,000 a month for three months. And which includes two viral LinkedIn posts a month. And I'm like, what does he mean by that? Because this discredits him. Yeah. Because even though this person was the only person in our ICP, I don't believe you. Yeah, right. Also, like LinkedIn, I think, categorizes a, a viral LinkedIn post as like 100,000 views. So you'd have mm. to have like a thousand plus reactions to get there. And most people don't get there nowadays. So like... I'm like, I, I want you to dig deeper on that, but I've already lost interest, which is actually kind of unfortunate because he was actually in our ICP. Right. <laughs> but you should not you should not guarantee that in case. No, you're, of course. Yeah. Not. I mean, nobody can guarantee that. Let's talk about now um, what benefits you've seen from this. Like, you know, it, it, it's a hard sell maybe to someone at the beginning to say, you know, this is an indirect source of revenue. Like, I mean, people ask me all the time, right? Yeah. Like, why are you doing this? How much money right. have you made right. from it? Right. I mean, um, first of all, like if we only did things that we can attribute revenue to, yeah, we'd be doing nothing. <laughs> like actually, we'd just be like trying to buy ads, right? Like right. there's so many things we do in, in marketing and branding that like really cannot, like you really can't attribute your own to. Yeah. You can't qu quantify it. Um, but what I do know that social and and back then I was only on LinkedIn. Yeah. So social was making up 20% of our demo traffic, which was like self-reported. Yeah. So that was the first question that we asked when someone's in our demo is like, how did you hear about us? Yeah. And they would say social, but there was only one channel. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, it was like taking up all my time. 
Uh, but I think the most important ROI, it, it just gave me a personal brand. Right? Like where else can you do that? Like I don't feel like, like for business software, yeah, um, that's important. Yeah, and and like LinkedIn is was my channel, but like some some, like crypto bros or you know some other internet entrepreneurs might use Twitter. Yeah, right? that's where they built their audience, like yep. especially very early on. But I think for business software, like I don't really see another channel outside of LinkedIn. And now like people are start, including myself, are starting to expand to like other channels like Instagram. Mm. TikTok and YouTube, but that's video. Like I'm talking right. like just, just written content. Um, but even just being on LinkedIn, um, I was invited as a guest on podcasts. I still, I still get that. Hmm. So these are not people I've reached out to. This is right. just people coming to me coming now, to like you. inviting right. me because now I seem like an expert in this. So they're inviting me to speak on their podcast about something I've either written about right. or just about founding companies or about bootstrapping. Right. Um, and because of that viral streak, I also was able to turn a couple of those into articles on Business Insider. Right. So right. what people don't know is companies like Business Insider have scouts on the platforms mm. to look for content like this that, that is interesting. So I don't even know where to start if I wanted to get mm. an article on Business Insider. I probably have to pay a PR company like yeah. five grand a month to get there. And I was quoted on multiple different articles, mm. like digitally on like media platforms like Forbes, <laughs> right? It's crazy. Yeah. And then once in a while, I still get some uh, journalists reach out to me because there's also a lot of contributors on, you know, Business Insider or Forbes right. or like whatever it might yeah, be yeah. that are writing something featuring, you know, certain founders or certain types of founders or exits or whatnot that I get to be a part of because I put myself out right. there. Right, you created an audience and that attracted this, yeah. you know, which, which they would have, like you said, <laughs> where would you even start? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> if you had no money. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and I also, you know, I also learned a lot of business strategies for free. Um, I, know if, I know I've touched on that, but it's, it's so important when you work remote and work alone. Like I work with David, he's my life yeah. partner, but he's a CTO, he's not customer facing. Yeah. Um, when you work alone, like you don't learn by osmosis from your coworkers. No, right. So this kind of is my office, it is my community, and I learn a lot of business strategies for free. And because I've built unique friendships with people that I've met on the platform, we just exchange notes oh, um, on like what each other are doing. Like not necessarily on like how to write on LinkedIn, right? but right. you know, what are you doing for your company? Like what am I, you know, this is how I feel. Like how did you get over that when you were feeling that? Like just. General kind of founder stuff. And is this happening really in the comments mostly or in the in, in DMs? Like DMs, like yeah, now right. it's like WhatsApp or text messages. Right, like right, once right. you kind of build that rapport with someone, then you right. exchange phone numbers. It's just easier, right? Like right. that's just where you live. But but yeah, how do you quantify that? This valuable resource yeah. of like free business knowledge from people who are experiencing the same problems yeah. as you. Yeah, I mean, like I don't believe in myself joining mastermind groups because yeah. I'm a nomad. And yeah. I can never make those calls. Right. Um, otherwise, I, I would. Mm. Um, but outside of that, like I think you just kind of have to get to know people through these digital platforms as the world becomes more remote. Yeah, sure. And there's also like a huge benefit, mm. I guess. A, like, um, like you feel happy when you can support others in their journey. Yeah. And part of people putting out content is because of that. Right. Like you want to like it sounds so egotistical. Right. It's just like, oh, I put out this stuff so I can help someone. But you feel pretty good about that. When yeah. people are like, hey, I read this or I listened to your podcast and like now I'm doing this thing differently now. Yeah. I mean, I personally think this is like one of the keys to happiness is that you're you're actually your focus is on helping other people. Like, you, yeah. yes, you are putting yourself out there, but you're putting out content that, you know, from your own experience would actually help people. Yeah. It's, it's extremely rewarding in a what could be a really lonely endeavor, you know? Yeah, and then having, you know, and having these conversations have forced me to think about my business in different ways, mm. like that I wouldn't otherwise have. Um, it's led me to multiple courses that I took. Yeah. Uh, that I also made you take. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the ones I don't want to take, I make you take. Um, you know, I've, I've actually made friends, like digital, fr digital friends that I'm never going to see, mm. like meet in person, that I feel like are genuinely rooting for my success. Yeah. And that's hard, like as a founder, right? Yeah. Like there's a lot of people in your social circle that like, they're just not doing what you do. Yeah, so they never understand. 
yeah, they don't really understand. Or like you're maybe you're in a competitive city, like maybe it's San Francisco or L.A. or, or New York right. or London. We're like, like you kind of question if people are happy for you. Right. Right. And so like I, having people that genu- genuinely want you to win is like such an awesome feeling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And these are all friends that, that I've met through there. And I know I've talked about also building a community of my own. But um, one of the biggest benefits of being on LinkedIn is like, just really being able to build my own community of founders. Right. Like, like at my fingertips that I can text, you know, we're on a WhatsApp group that like, that I respect that I I can just go to for, for any problem and then they can go to each other. So that's just another way of like being able to help someone else. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap up. Um, I mean, we talked about, uh, why you, so why you started in the first place, right? Um, how you did it, you say, gave some very good hacks, I think, to get started, uh, and then talked about the benefits, uh, including those that are more qualitative and intangible, that nevertheless add, you know, are, are real genuine benefits. So from this episode, what is your hot take? I think my hot take here, um, just from going on this journey myself, is... Yeah. If you're a startup founder and you are not putting yourself out there on social, if you're not building Mm -hmm. a personal brand, you are losing to someone that is doing that, right? Say like if somebody's choosing between eWebinar and something else and that founder is out there and they seem more legit and that person seems more accessible and smarter and I'm just there with a few hundred connections and not an active profile. Like, unfortunately that's my first impression. Yeah. Right. So yeah, my hot take is like, don't put yourself in a position where you're losing to someone Mm -hmm. because it is not just about like writing a piece of content on LinkedIn. It's all the benefits that you cannot quantify that isn't like revenue into your business, but it's re it's growth. Yeah. As a person and as, a, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, right. What's your hot take? Well, you know, having done none of this myself. <laughs> yeah, being on the sidelines. <laughs> uh, being on the yeah. sidelines, my hot take is Melissa Kwan is tenacious AF. <laughs> I like that. I mean, it's like... That's my favorite hot take of yours so far. <laughs> <laughs> wonder why. It's not um, me. <laughs> but like, you know, something I think you have to do when you're bootstrapping is just figure it out, create systems be consistent. Like half of, I mean, think about how much of our success that we have had comes down to those, that's those simple approaches. Like don't, you have to be consistent. You have to have a system. You have to find ways to streamline. Um, So anyway, you have to be tenacious AF. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I've got a small favor to ask. The only way Profit Let grows is by word of mouth. So if you'll do us a favor and hit the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening or watching this podcast right now, it'd mean the world to us and help us continue to spend time making these episodes for you. Ping me on LinkedIn if there are particular topics you want us to get into this season. Send me any feedback you have on this podcast because I love hearing from you. My name is Melissa Kwan, last name spelled K-W-A-N. To get notified of new episodes, join our mailing list by going to profitled.fm. I promise to only share things you'll actually care about. Thanks for listening. Bye now.